The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus told his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones, when taking their lamps, brought no oil with them, but the wise brought flasks of oil with their lamps. Since the bridegroom was long delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight there was a cry, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise ones replied, No, for there may not be enough for us and you. Go instead to the merchants and buy some for yourselves. While they went off to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went into the wedding feast with him. Then the door was locked. Afterwards, the other virgins came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he said in reply, Amen, I say to you, I do not know you. Therefore, stay awake, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The Gospel of the Lord. So Jesus tells us this parable of the ten virgins, five foolish and five wise, five of whom are prepared when the bridegroom arrives and five of whom are not. Especially after St. Paul's words in that second reading, you know that the Lord will come suddenly with the voice of an archangel and with a trumpet blast and is going to sweep us up all up into the clouds to see the Lord. We can tend to hear the parable of the ten virgins as an image of the end of the world or of the end of our lives, that we do not know the time or the place when we'll be called home, and therefore we must be prepared always. We have to make sure, as a beautiful hospice patient once said to me in his last days, that my house is in order before I head off to my big vacation. That's what he said in his last days. And surely that's an important reading of Jesus' parable of the ten virgins. When our time comes, we want to make sure that our lamps are filled with oil and our wicks trimmed and we're ready to meet the Lord. But, as important as such a reading is, it's only part of the parable. The parable is only in part about the end of our lives. What else is it about? Perhaps to shed some light, I could tell a simple personal story, but it's one any of us could tell, because this has happened to all of us, each in our own way. I was in my first year of teaching middle school religion at a Catholic school in Philadelphia. And like all middle school teachers, I had one of those students, the one who just drove me nuts on a daily basis, talking, squirming, asking questions completely irrelevant to the rest of the class, bothering other students, but most of all, bothering me constantly. But as I found to be true over the years in middle school, the most troublesome students would, oddly enough, often be the ones most likely to stop by after class, mostly just to bother me some more. So the student would often come by at the end of the day and I'd be busy grading papers or getting my lesson plans ready for the next day so I didn't have to do them at night. And he'd just kind of hang around and bug me. And I was always too busy for him, always. Well, to make a long story short, one day in the spring semester, almost a year into his antics and after-school visits, the weather had turned nice again, and I don't know what got into me, but I asked him if he wanted to go have a baseball catch. And so we grabbed a couple gloves, and we went out to this kind of grassy patch next to my classroom, and we just started to toss the ball back and forth. And you know what happens when you start to toss the ball back and forth with someone? You start to talk. You just start to have a conversation. 
And so I started to ask him about his other classes, and I asked him about his friends at school. And then I asked him about his family. And as we were standing there throwing the ball back and forth, all of a sudden I saw that he had started to cry. And so we stopped throwing and we started walking. And over the next 45 minutes, I heard the story of how the student's parents had been going through a painful separation through that whole year, and they just decided to divorce. And for the next three years at that school, I accompanied that student as he went through that painful time and tried to adjust to this new reality. I think I served as an instrument of grace for him, providing some stability and care, and he served as an instrument of grace for me, calling me at the very beginning of my teaching career to slow down and come to a deeper understanding of what my students were going through. But it took me eight months of his persistent antics to finally catch on that he was trying to tell me something. And if he wasn't so persistent, I would have missed it entirely. As the parable says today, the door would have been locked, and it's just an opportunity missed. We could each tell many such stories, right? Of missing opportunities because of our own busyness and distraction. All kinds of legitimate and not so legitimate reasons we miss opportunities right in front of us. And this is a second reading of Jesus' parable of the ten virgins. Remember, Jesus' message was not just, you know, the kingdom of God is coming at the end of time. But also, more frequently, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is in your midst. The kingdom of God is at hand. God is seeking to visit his people right now. Can we see it? Are we ready? Are our lamps filled with oil? and our wicks trimmed today. For as today's gospel tells us, we know neither the day nor the hour when God is going to move in our lives and try to make God's self present to us in a powerful way. So if this is true, not only that the kingdom of God is to come in all its fullness at the end of time, but also that the kingdom of God is in our midst then how are we to remain alert on a daily basis? Or to use the imagery of Jesus' parable, what is this precious oil with which we are to keep our lamps filled that we might be ready when the Lord comes? What is this oil in our lives that keeps us alert and attuned to God's movements in our daily life? Surely there are many answers to that question from the sacraments to being part of a faith community to doing service for others, I want to focus briefly on just one, and that's a daily life of prayer. In our hectic lives, nourishing a daily life of prayer is something we all struggle with, myself included. And yet there is hardly a more effective way to make sure our lamps are filled with oil for when God decides to move in our life on any given day. We need look no further than Jesus himself. There's perhaps no more frequent line in all the Gospels than something like, and Jesus withdrew to spend the night in prayer, or Jesus went up the mountainside to pray, or Jesus withdrew to a solitary place to pray. It happens over and over and over again in the Gospels. Now think about that. If Jesus, who more or less had an umbilical cord right to the Father, and I realize that imagery is out of whack with the gender there, but you get the point. If, if Jesus, who had, who had basically an umbilical cord to the Father, had to constantly nourish a life of prayer to make sure he was attuned to how his Father was working in his life, then how can we ever think to get through our lives without one? And we can see in the Gospels a really profound effect that this had in Jesus' life. For as many times as we hear that Jesus withdrew to a solitary place to pray, we also hear him then say, sometime right after, something like, I've come not to do my own will, but the will of my Father. Or the words I speak are not my own, they're the words of my Father. Or my Father and I are one. Those are, those are profound insights. He, he, he's becoming so attuned that the Father is at work in his life every day. So that when he comes down from the mountain, 
This is what reminded me of that student. When he comes down from the mountain after a night in prayer and he encounters a leper or he encounters a blind person or he encounters a deaf person or a mute person or the Pharisees or his disciples fighting or whatever, the cru- he doesn't see it as something that he has to get around so that he can get on to his work of building up the kingdom. He sees it as the kingdom right there, trying to break forth in that person right in front of him, in the leper, in the blind person, in his disciples. He sees the kingdom trying to break forth right in front of him, in the person that's right there. Jesus' life of prayer convinces him of the truth that the kingdom of God is in fact in our midst trying to break through in the person or event that's right before our eyes. And a daily life of prayer is oil in the lamp that allows us to be ready for when the Lord will knock. And that's happening every day. For the kingdom of God is in our midst. The kingdom of God is at hand.